Welcome to the Unsafe Spaces podcast, where we dig beneath the surface and challenge conventional wisdoms. I'm your host, Michael Bohannes. Victor Hugo said that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. In this show, we explore ideas that can help you change how you see the world, make better decisions in life, and maybe get outside your comfort zone to work on the goals you always wanted to achieve. Welcome to episode six of the Unsafe Spaces podcast. And um, today I'm talking to Brett Putter. Brett is a longtime uh, recruiter of senior executive and a company culture expert. And he just recently uh, published his first book, which is called Culture Decks Decoded. And it's a compilation and very interesting critique of tech companies' culture manifestos. It is well structured and engagingly written, and uh, it dissects uh, many company handbooks along thematic lines. And he explores topics such as vision, mission, history, values, onboarding, transparency, and failure. And he reviews how the culture decks of companies such as Netflix, LinkedIn, Hootsuite, HubSpot, Asana, and many others cover these subjects. There's probably very few people who can claim a deeper understanding of company culture than, than Brett. He's been in recruiting for 16 years and has done, uh, as he says, 5,000 interviews, which is just imagine, <laughs> it's a pretty spectacular number. And those uh, interviews where he was interviewing job candidates that he was about to place, these interviews have taught him to instantly scan a candidate and detect whether there is a fit with their would-be employer. And so he has taken this expertise and started the culture consultancy Culture Gene in early 2017. And there he's advising companies who want to fix their company culture or set things up correctly right from the start. And uh, Brett already is working on his second book, which is going to be published in Q2 next year, 2019. In our conversation, we cover how much of other company culture decks you can simply steal with pride or whether you should build your own from scratch why the most successful companies have a cult-like culture, and we even go into the topic of having a culture deck for your family. So that's an interesting one, so stick around. All right, without any further ado, I give you Brett Putter. All right, All right. we are live with Mr. Brett Putter. Brett, how are you? Very good, thank you, Michael. How are you? I'm very, very well. Thank you for taking the time. Well, my, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Excellent. So, Brett, um, you've interviewed 5,000 people, as you say, on your uh, LinkedIn profile yeah. in your professional life. How does it feel to be in the, on the other side of the interviewing table? Um, I hope that I can do it justice. Right. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really good to be on the side for a change because um, yeah. you've got to do all the thinking and I can obviously just sit back and relax. Exactly. You don't have to do any thinking at all because this is this is about a topic that you are extremely proficient in and you know very, very well, which is uh, culture. You've written a book, you're writing a second one already, which is quite impressive. You have quite an impressive output there to do that. And as well, if I, I don't think I'm going to be breaking any major news here, you've just become a father. So how do you cram all that into one uh, into this amazing burst of productivity that you have? Well, it's it's. Um it's not easy. I've now resorted to waking up at 6 a.m. to to write um, because I, I I do have a, a, a wonderful daughter and wife to spend as much time with as I can and uh, business to run. So um, it's not easy, but I'm really enjoying it. Uh, the burst the burst of productivity was almost a result of my lack of productivity. I'd hit the wall with the first book. And so decided to write a short little ebook, which then turned into Culture Dex Decoded. Interesting. So you were writing the main book, the Culture Gene. What's it called? Correct, the Culture Gene. The Culture Gene. That's your that's your company name and also the book name. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you were writing that. You hit the wall. You so you needed to take a bit of a break, and go and you started writing the other one. Yeah, I I didn't really think that it would it would it would help. I just I didn't know what to do because. Looking at the pages that I'd written, I almost didn't understand what I'd... It, almost as if it was in Latin. Uh, I didn't understand what I'd written. I couldn't make sense of it. So um, I'd been writing and writing, and I'm not a particularly good writer. So it's hard work for me. It's a little bit like wading through treacle. 
And um, I then just thought, okay, well, I'd written a blog about culture decks and uh, decided that I would um, sort of write a little ebook which I could use as a marketing tool. And it just scaled and scaled and scaled from there. It's now a 280 page um, book. Mm -hmm. What were you stuck with? Which kind of area, part of the book, were you, did you feel stuck with? Um, well, it goes, it actually goes back to my, um, the book is essentially I've taken uh, over the last year and, and a half, I've interviewed 40 CEOs of high growth companies um, who've clearly defined cu culture. And I essentially asking them what they did, why they did it, how, what they'd learned. And um, I wrote those blogs all in long form. And you actually did give me some advice saying shorten them down, but I, I didn't listen. Um, and um, I decided that I would then take those blogs and use that content for the book. But because I'd written the blogs and then wrote the book, and then I, my, I went to my wife after I'd finished writing the book the first time, and I asked her, "What do you, you know, can you give me your thoughts? It's finished now. What do you think?" She had to read the whole thing. Yeah, she had to read the whole thing, <laughs> and you know her. Um, and she uh, she asked me, "Do you really want to know what I think?" And uh, I said, "Yes." And she said, "Well, it's shit." Mm. And she was right. She said, "You know, you know that is the case. You're going to have to really, you've got to restructure it, and you've got to think about it in a different way." And I think I did that with her help. But by then, I, I'd, I'd almost hit a wall yeah. by rewriting, rewriting, you know, looking at it again in different ways. So um, this the Culture Dex Decoder just came from that. And it's almost like it cleared the cache because I've gone back to writing uh, the culture gene mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm really enjoying it now. It's, it's, writ it's done. It just done. needs to be, you know, it needs to be tweaked. It needs to be improved. Okay. okay. So the, the Culture Dex book is coming out when? Uh, I keep saying in about three to four weeks, mm -hmm. um, but I'm hoping this time it really is in three to four weeks. It's been a challenge because the design of the interior is different to a normal book, of, yeah. obviously just text because there's lots of images yeah. um, and text. So so it's, we, it's just been a little bit trickier working that out and it's taken longer than I expected. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we're pretty we're pretty close now. Yeah. No, I really like the design of the book. I mean, you shared the ebook e version with me. I really like the design of the book. It's very um, like you feel you, you can jump between sections very easily. So that panel on the right hand side mm -hmm. where you show these different chapters, that's super useful. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like a book you have to read from end to end. So especially when you are a s startup founder who's looking for some advice and some inspiration, I think these sections give you really good um, like a navigation to, to, to go by. So I, I really like that about the book. Um, before we go into it, though, I would be interested very much in your personal background. So obviously, I can hear you're from South Africa. Tell us your story. Where did you come from and how, how did you become interested in startup cultures? Yeah, so I came over in 99 um, and came over to set up a dot-com which uh, my timing was epic because it because the, the entire market collapsed. Um, and then I got into executive search. What kind of dot .com would that have been? It was actually, I, I, I like to um, uh, arrogantly call myself the original Summer Brothers mm. <laughs> because I was copying a, a Bill Gross Idea Lab um, business called intranets.com. Mm -hmm. And um, intranets.com obviously was not a major success. They raised 80 million and, exit and sold for 10. Uh, so not great, but um, I put a team together and um, halfway through the raising of, of, of a major round, uh, the nuclear winter started. Yeah. So I then went and got a job and became sensible and, and tried to hide my entrepreneurial roots somewhere. <laughs> well... You're coming back to them now, so exactly, exactly. exactly. So, okay, so but let's rewind. So, what was your what was that job? So, I am. I, um, I originally joined a company as a business development manager, and um, worked worked at a, at um, at in. I forgot my name now. Um, in Clarity, worked at In Clarity for uh, a year, and um, I I decided that telco wasn't my thing and uh, then decided uh, joined a executive search firm and worked there for 16 years uh, our focus was on high growth early stage companies so working with startups 
most of the time. Occasionally, we'd work with some of the bigger, hairier gorillas, but uh, that would always be to do something entrepreneurial or startup minded. And um, yeah, probably worked on about 400 companies, interviewed over 5,000 senior executives. Um, and that's what that's essentially where um, the, the whole co- interest in culture started. Because you write in the book that one of the reasons why you were interested in culture was that you saw that companies that had clarity about their company culture were much easier to work with because you knew what kind of person would be a good fit when you then interviewed them. Am yeah, that's, yeah that's, that, that's right. I, I found that um, the CEO, when the CEO had a, a pretty good understanding of their culture, it allowed me to find candidates that both matched the skills and experience required and the values of the company. And th- the searches just ran smoother um, and arguably looking back, had, well, not even arguably, they had a much better outcome. A lot of the, a lot of the, company, a lot of the companies I worked with um, in the sort of past three or four years have had really good results and continue to do well. And most of the senior execs I placed in those companies are still with those companies, which just demonstrates that when, when that culture match values matches there, it, it, it clicks and comes together really nicely. Mm-hmm. In those, so 5,000, it's become almost unimaginable to have interviewed 5,000 people. I did the quick maths. If it's like 16 years, it's like 300 people a year. Yeah. That means so easily one a work day, yeah. probably more. What, are there any like takeaways have you what is like that what are what are the highlights are there any experience where you say this is a great question to ask for example as an interview question with anything that kind of reveals the person to you or are there any kind of like funny anecdotes any outrageous answers that you received anything that comes to mind uh there there was there was one situation that um i i got a call from and the head of HR of a company uh, who will remain nameless, um, who, who called me up and said, can you just, can you just send me, resend me the um, references that you took on, on that particular candidate? And um, I said, sure. And said, why? And she said, well, it's it, it just behaving very oddly. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, he kept the engineering team of 60 people waiting for 45 minutes for a team photograph while he did his makeup. <laughs> and you just can't reference that. Wow. <laughs> you really just can't reference that. Um, and actually, that was one, it's one of oh my, my it's one of the two uh, of, in all, all my years of, of the two real didn't end up, that search didn't, didn't that outcome didn't end up that, that well. Yeah, that, that. That sounds like it. Especially, was there was this company clear about their culture? Uh, this was probably two thousand and five, two thousand and six. So it was long before I I I knew what I knew what how important culture was going to mm. become. Do you have a favorite question to ask these senior people that you placed? Anything that kind of reveals them to you? The first question I ask every candidate is why, uh-huh. why the company? Yeah. And then I'd follow it with as many whys as I can get out of the candidate. Mm. Um, so for me, if they've done their research and there is a really good resonance with between the company and the individual, you will get that right right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they've if they've thought about it, if they've really analyzed the company, and if they're passionate and interested about it, then you know that's yeah. that's the first question I open with. Okay. And so. Why do you? Is it because you saw this match of when there's when they are clear about the culture, then the hiring process is smooth? Is this where then your interest in culture came from? Why you started the blog? Is that the reason? Yeah, that's well. Yeah, that's that's where it originated. Um, I then I found that uh, very few of the CEOs I worked with and hiring managers I worked with actually had a, had any understanding of their culture. And it turns out that nine out of 10 people have no idea because they haven't done any work on it. Mm. Um, and that got me thinking about actually helping the people that I was talking to understand their culture. So initially, I just created a list of 100 behaviors and values and put it, and put it in front of them and said, choose 10. Mm-hmm. And then we'd start a conversation about it. And we'd spend 70, 80 percent of the time talking about their company and 20 percent of the time talking about the role. 
which was fine because you know the VP engineering for the most part is a VP engineering. Um, and I then started to develop that, and that's where I um, I thought, okay, there is definitely something here. I started to read more about culture, and I read some some books that gave me a deeper insight into it, and and then I. Actually, was encouraged by hat tip to my ice cube, which you will you will know what I'm talking about. Um, but tell the, tell so, ice is, what it is. Um, ice is a um, a network of entrepreneurs, uh, originally founded by Alex Hoy, and now run by Natasha and uh, a, a committee of people. Uh, really headquartered out of London, but we've got members in you know across Europe, the US, and. Uh, we get together, uh, one of the things we do is get together once a month in small groups of people, about eight people, and we go through a process, it's essentially allowing entrepreneurs to share their deepest, darkest secrets or their deepest, darkest moments or their best moments and share share moments, share, share experiences with one another mm-hmm. uh, because it's quite a lonely existence, this entrepreneurial existence, and this is a, a tool for making it less so. And actually, my uh, ice cube, as we as we call them, took me to task about about this whole culture thing, and 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 made forced me to um, uh, pull my finger out and actually start really digging into it. And um, one of the one of the cube members gave me a a book to read uh, called The Millionaire Messenger, which is a book um, on subject matter expertise by a subject matter expert. And he's a subject matter expert on subject matter expertise. Um, that sounds uh, <laughs> very meta. <laughs> um, and um, it's it's a uh, it was really uh, fascinating, uh, really well structured, and it got me thinking. Okay, I need to now start creating content. So that's where the blogs came from. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So that was essentially the your move towards Culture Gene from the Forsyth Group to Culture Gene was. Uh, you having this insight is the cube kind of uh, is the ice cube that what triggered it? Yeah, the ice cube didn't trigger it, but the ice cube forced me to to actually do something about it. Yeah, rather than having it as a bit of a side gig. Yeah, and and rather than sort of talking about it and and you know saying you know if only if it was more a case of just go and do it, just go and get you know just go and get some content under your belt, go and meet people, go and start talking about it, read about it, and and it really. Uh, because you meet once a month, you essentially have to it's not. A, it's, it's an accountability. Yeah, 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 and and that was really good for me because oh. I, you know, every time I read another blog or interviewed somebody else, it was something that I could essentially report back on. Yeah. Absolutely, and already you were known in the community as the culture guy, but I think writing a book is something that really puts you very firmly on the map, and you have two now, right? <laughs> so you have two. One you have one coming out soon, and the other one. Some when is the other one coming out? Later this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm aiming. I'm aiming for December, yeah. uh, early December. And um, if my daughter gives me the time, then I will. Uh, I'll get it done by then. Excellent. So, so quickly back to this topic of subject matter expertise. You can. Could you give us like the high level? What's the message of the book that kind of resonated for you, where you thought, yes, I have to essentially write a book in order to put myself firmly into the map. So the author, whose name I now forget, argues that anybody can become a subject matter expert. If you apply enough time to it, you, you, you literally can. Because if you, if you focus on one subject that hard and that intensely for long enough, you will know more than pretty much everybody else. I was fortunate to have worked in you know, high growth, early stage, the startup environment for 16 years. Um, and that allowed me and different insight into culture and how important culture is. So I had the advantage of a lot of not subject matter expertise, but a lot of insight into into the startup world. And I wanted to apply what I was learning to that. So essentially what the author says is you've got to you know just start creating content do blogs then videos um if you can host events which i did with silicon valley bank we we had the culture eat strategy for breakfast event do workshops which i've done um i haven't done podcasts yet um and and may may do that uh, and then books and and you know so and the book essentially is that the uh, at the pinnacle of that you know whether whether you are or, or you aren't a subject matter expert for some reason once the book is there you perceive to be 
Absolutely. Do you have the book published by a professional publishing house or just do you just write it and just put it out there, print it yourself? So I'm so, uh, it's being self-published mm -hmm. and um, having now got into this, well, and getting a better understanding of self-publishing, it's actually almost a full time job to do it properly um, there are many different platforms there are many different ways to build up uh, a database of, of, of contacts to to reach etc etc so it's quite a it's quite a involved you don't just get it up on you know uh, up on amazon and mm. and uh hope for, hope for the best you've got to do a lot around it but um yeah i i i think there's i think if you are successful there is also a little bit more margin in it um, versus a typical typical publisher, but at the end of the day, you know, my expectation is not to sell a billion copies of this thing. It's 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 to get feedback. It's to get you know. I I do believe that Culture Dex Decoded is a really valuable piece of work, and so I, I'm glad. It, you know, once it's out there, I'll be glad it's out. Is it going to be in print? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's just e -book. no, it's actually not going to be ebook. Oh, okay. Um, because uh, it could be PDF, but um, there are too many pictures and there are too many links. You know, that it just just won't work. Yeah. I, I I had I tried it. I tried it out and tested it, but it's going to be it's going to be in print. Yeah, excellent. No, I love print. I think it's so under underused and undervalued by many people. I mean, you you know, I'm I'm. Uh, one of my main products that I essentially sell on the agency is a is a printed book, and I think it just keeps somebody so much more front of mind. Mm -hmm. Like I have, I mean, my bed is surrounded in books, you know, so anytime I'm, I'm, I'm going to bed, I'm just, okay, what am I going to pick now for the last 15 minutes of the day? And it's just the presence that you achieve if you've written a great book. It can just lie on people's bedside tables, on people's desks at work and have such much more powerful impact than just an e-book. Yeah, it's yeah. I, way stronger and incomparably. I I like the smell of a book. I like yeah. the, the the touch of a book. I, I obviously you know I read voraciously, so I've got, I've got a Kindle. And but if I, when I can, I will you know if I'm at home, I've got mm. books that I prefer to open. Yeah, excellent, great. So let's get into the book. Who is your target audience for it? Is it founders? Yeah, it's it's company leaders and leaders of uh, HR, talent, and people functions essentially. But um, it's. It's aimed at founders who are who are trying to do something around this. I, I've spoken to a lot of, of of founders and HR leaders who've said to me they've tried to do they've tried to create their own culture deck, and they've struggled because there's there's no real framework out there, and there are just so many and so many types. Um, that's where that's and that was the reason why I wrote the blog initially is just to first of all pull all the, the culture decks together and say here they all are if you want to you know go through them and knock yourself out that brings me to the question of how much to steal with pride because i have one friend who's written a great culture deck i think he also kind of clobbered them together from various different sources but it's really uniquely him but he and i are so aligned in how we see the world that i was thinking if I partially use that for a company that I was an employee of, but I kind of wanted to inculcate these kind of values on my team, but you cannot really do that as, as a presented as an official deck, of course, because if you're an employee, you're not leading the whole company. But I was thinking if I'm going to start the next company that I'm going to be starting with, and definitely at Content360, once, we, once I hire people now, I'm working only with freelancers. Once I hire people, that will be significant part of it will be my culture deck. Is that a right approach to take? Can I simply, because I just agree with somebody's culture deck, can I just copy and paste and steal with pride? I don't think you can take anybody's entire culture deck. Of course not entirely, but let's um, say 50, 60% of it. I would even say 50, 60, 70% of it is is a stretch because that's the majority of their culture that you're copying. But if I, what if I love the culture? Let's say even I worked there, which I didn't, but I spent a bit of time with him while, and I observed him. As a, like, I was there when I saw him, how he interacts with the team, and I just love the culture, how he did it. Still not. Well, if you if you copy a culture deck to a large degree, you are assuming that you're going to your your comp, your culture and who you are is going to match that culture. Because what you're doing is you, a culture deck is essentially a way of saying this is how we work, this is what we mm -hmm. do, and that's it's not going to match. There'll be 
there'll be very few, there'll be some, some parts of it that match. But I would be very surprised if 60 or 70% of your culture matched, your company culture matched with their company culture. For example, what, what, what's their line of business? Uh, it's an e-commerce company. And and what and your line of business will be? It's 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 an agency. Okay, so just firstly, on those two levels, they're they're fundamentally beasts. It's fundamentally different beasts. Mm. And if culture is the way we work around here, the way somebody works in an e-commerce business is going to be different to the way somebody works in an agency. And I do think you'll be able to take a fair amount of it because you're similar people. Mm-hmm. But a culture deck, writing a culture deck in the beginning of a business is quite hard to do because you haven't actually, you're building your culture. Um, you, you, to write a, a culture deck decently, you have to know what your, a, your values are, your mission, your vision, essentially the way you work, what, what's unique about your company, your, your approach to transparency, failure, um, f- feedback, uh, all these sorts of pieces that will be developed over time. So my advice to to uh, founders and or people who are starting their business is to actually understand what a what a what a framework of what a, a good culture deck could look like, and then fill it in over time until you're ready for your culture deck. So so build it based on the behaviors that you're seeing. Okay, well, that's my question. Should a culture deck be aspirational or descriptive? A culture deck can be both because you are, you, you're never going to achieve, off, you know, the, the, the ultimate of, of um, you know, all of, your, all of the values that you, you set for yourself, your vision, your mission. Often your, your values, some of them are aspirational. Your vision is aspirational because you aren't there yet. Um, so it's a combination of what is what you can achieve and what you want to achieve, and it's something that um, I believe should contain both. Uh, there are certain elements that you know this is these are if you're going to go so far as, for example, net, um, Netflix, where they say this is what this is what will get you hired, this is what will get you promoted, and this is what will get you fired. You know that's very prescriptive. It's re- very real and it's very now. The thing about a culture deck is it should adapt as the com- as the company's culture adapts. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. I use this a lot when um, I do. <coughs> sorry, when I do tone of voice documents with my clients, right? So when when somebody wants to have their content created, you need to have something that any con- any good writer can then take, read through. Ah, this is who I'm writing as, you know, and like an actor get into a mm-hmm. role. Mm-hmm. This is what a good tone of voice document is. And it's important to have it as a tool that grows over time. Like somebody, for example, gives you feedback on a blog post that you've written for that company. And they say, I really don't like this turn of phrase. That has to go straight into the tone of voice document, right? And that's how you constantly, it's a constantly growing and evolving thing. And it's always something that you can then, once you've created a piece for them, can hold yourself accountable to. Yeah. So probably it's similar with the it, culture. It, it, deck, is, right? it is similar because there is a, um, the business is evolving and growing and developing all the time, which means that, and, and none of these, whether it's, your, you, you, I, I, you know, from a culture perspective, a company's culture and probably tone of voice at the size of 10, is completely different to the size of 50 people or 200 people. Um, from a culture perspective, that changes all the time because it's the way you work around here. I don't know if that's the same with, with tone of voice per se, but from a culture perspective, it certainly it will change. But is that a good thing? Because ultimately you want the culture deck to be something of a constitution for the company, isn't it? No. You, the way I, well, the way I look at it, and actually it doesn't matter what I think, frankly, because if whatever works for your company, if that works, yeah. that's fine. Well, but you're the expert. So uh, but the way I look at it is your values are the DNA of the business. And your values, for the most part, stay the same. Because exactly. they, are, they are our values. They are the founders' values and the people they hire initially. And then if they, if, if they put that into some form of, um, they define it in some way, then those values become... The, the DNA for the business moving forward. But the culture, which the, 
your 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 average definition of culture or the generalized definition of culture is the way we work around here you know the way you work when you're 10 is different to the way you work when you're 200 yeah. yes okay fair enough those are kind of like the min the more mundane aspects of how you work but i wonder if that would even be in a culture deck in something like in the way we work around here so let me tell you what i mean with that have you do you know Ray Dalio's principles? Mm -hmm. All right. Have you have you read it or do, I got halfway. Okay. I love the book because it really it even gives you a structure in like the highest level principles. There's like five of them in life principles. Yeah. And then it branches into many, many sub branches and he even then summarizes it very neatly at the end of that section with the you know, the top and the and the bottom branches and so on. I see a culture deck as something where the top branches are really like staples are probably the values you can call them principles values is probably the same thing yeah. right and then as you grow those branches the sub branches they maybe change yeah but the core trunks of the company the dna as you call it that yeah. needs to stay stable that's what, what i would call it's like the, any constitution in a country in a let's say in a more civil law system a constitution needs a th two-thirds majority to be changed Right? Those are the like the core principles that almost are uh, very difficult to change. Laws, normal laws, require a simple majority to change. And so those are the, within that framework, they are the ones that are more malleable. Mm -hmm. But the core foundational principles should be unchanging. Would you, is this, is this a fair representation? Or yeah, I think it's, I think, I think they should, they should be fairly, cons they should be consistent. However, in my opinion, the best founders, the best CEOs, evaluate whether their company is living the values on an ongoing basis so yeah. so um if if the company is but if the company for some reason start either either your values are defined incorrectly or the company due to circumstance starts behaving in certain ways that don't align with the values then you need to think about that you need to go and say okay do we have to change the behavior or do we have to rethink the values um, so the way, in terms of your branches and sub branches, the way I look at, at this it, from a values perspective is the values the values of a business are as consistent as they can be, um, and associated with every value is an expected behavior, one or more. So, and a good example would be, let's say, my our value is teamwork. The expected behavior against teamwork could be. We're a group of people working together to achieve an aim, and um, we, we, you know, it's all we, we focus on communicating to do that. That could be one person's perspective on on teamwork. My perspective on teamwork could be the team always comes first. They're we're talking about the same thing, but they're slightly different. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. So so values need to have those sub branches. They need yes. to have the expected behaviors defined, so that your people when they look when they they actually understand what that value that word teamwork really means to the organization to this the question how should then the culture deck be cons be what should the genesis of it be should it be something that the founder comes up with and then gets the company to approve should it be bottom up like in zappos what have you seen what is the usual uh, yeah, genesis there, of a good culture deck. There is no, there is no usual, but there are. Uh, I see the the culture decks that resonate the most and are the most effective do include the the team, the the the, the broader team, whether it's driven by uh, the founder or somebody interpreting what the, the what what the values are and then sharing and then asking for feedback. Um, that's that. Uh, there are very few really authentic culture decks that do not include feedback and involvement from from the team i don't think there's one way to do it mm. though you know it depends on how it depends on on the on the approach of the company and how big it is and, and what they want to okay so you, want to well. so you wouldn't necessarily be prescriptive in this if somebody came to you and said brett i want to do my culture deck for the company you would not give them like a roadmap to do it no i i would i would ask them how big's your company mm. um what have you got to find already? Uh, where are you going to need input? 
do you need any input at all? And based on that, then say to them, well, you know, you, you're, you're 60% of the way there. You're going to have to think about the other 40% in the following ways and maybe include people for that. Mm. Um, but if somebody, if somebody really, if a founder has been running their business for five years and they want to, you know, write it all out and put it out there, you know, that's fine. It's their business. It's the way they run it. But I would personally say involve your team in some, in mm. some way. Mm -hmm. So you go into many different uh, companies' decks. There is Patreon, there is Netflix, there is Hootsuite, many others. Which ones that you saw would strike you as, what are your like top three? From, from so can, Netf can Netflix, Netflix is my Netflix is, is my top one, top one. because it was the you know it set the set, original concept yeah deck it set well. it set the ball rolling and it's so damn good mm. it really it, is, it is good, really yeah. is good you know if you read that document it's 125 pages if you read that document you know exactly whether you want to work at that company or not which is one of the main aims of a document like that um, it's it's about attracting or repelling. Although, have you read the? Have you heard about the recent news about Netflix, where they are banning looking in each, into each other's eyes for longer than five seconds? That I haven't heard about. It's um, this, um, you and I would have been banned. Exactly. <laughs> Especially like in the, la like the last ten seconds, we already screwed. <laughs> I'd, but I'd, it, I'd have to look at. I'd have to look at that. It's a response to Me Too. It's not the company has not confirmed it, but it is like from some sources that uh, is obtained. So okay. I have to be correct in representing it. But there is a certain, I mean, there's this thing in the air. It's MSNBC, for example, people banned hugging, right? So the HR departments have banned hugging. It's all, all the fallout from Me Too. So anything that could be construed as a too long a stare has been banned, right? So this is something that especially has been circulating around Netflix. I'm not going to put you on the spot if you haven't heard about it. I think it's ridiculous. No but anyway, but it's, yeah. not, it's not, you know... I've I've witnessed many different types of cultures, um, from 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 cultures that I would I could not bear to work in to cultures that I would love to work in, um, and everything in between. And you know, if if I would be very surprised if Netflix allowed that to happen because they seem to have their their head screwed on their shoulders. Mm. Um, going that far for me is you know it's 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 too far. What are the, you mentioned the horrible cultures that you've experienced. Can you, no names of course, but can you give an example of what such a culture was that was kind of ingrained in the DNA of the company? Um, so I like to talk about, um, I, 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 I particularly like to, to talk about Uber um, because I actually think Uber is a strong culture. Um, and I think Uber the culture Uber had in the beginning was necessary. So it was right for Uber, whether you wanted to work there or not, and whether you want to work there or not is, is neither here nor there. People from the outside looking in will go, that's terrible. And there are certain, definitely certain behaviors and certain things that happen in the company that are appalling. But if you think about what that company had to do to get to where it is, and if that was the outcome, then that was exactly the right culture. The problem is it wasn't managed properly. Okay, so if you look at if you look at the difference between at the, almost at the same time these these businesses were being built, but if you look at the difference between Brian Chesky and Travis, you can Brian Chesky went to Peter Thiel, and when Peter Thiel put in 150 million and said to him, "What's the one piece of advice you would give me now that you've invested 150 million in my business?" and Peter Thiel said, "Don't fuck up the culture." And Peter and Chesky then ensured that he hasn't so far. He's really invested heavily. They invest a lot of money on on ensuring the culture is lived and driven um, and, and, and embedded in the organization. Whereas I think Uber just allowed it to go too far. But that culture was necessary, I believe, to get the business to where to where it is. Whether it's right or wrong for you to work in that business is, you know, that's your choice. So, what specifics about the Uber culture do you think were necessary? Well, in if you look back at some of the early documents, you will you will see you will see that they they talk about fierceness. That's what that was that was required to work at Uber. Fierceness. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with colleagues is a boxing metaphor. 
okay mm -hmm. super pumpness all right these are words that that you wouldn't see you know on coca-cola's list of values mm. or etsy's etsy's <laughs> etsy's list of values or yeah. you know it, the, 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 they were the, those the, and but that was what was required and yeah. and because they because they were creating a whole new market a whole new segment and would your theory then be that because these things don't go unchecked that's when it then leads to this culture of misogyny and sexual abuse that that, that happened correct. later on correct right it's because it probably attracts two competitive people and two like ruthless people who then believe that the world owes them something and and I don't know if it, I don't know if it's the world owes them something, but but it, if you if you are recruiting for those for those those words or those behaviors associated with those you'll words, you get the assholes. Then you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get them. Mm. You'll get a bunch of assholes. You get a bunch of good people who are just very driven and very you know. And and I've spoken to a lot of people who work at Uber and they really enjoy it. They you know they think it's great and um, Dara is doing doing a good job mm. trying to turn it around um, in terms of the, the culture perspective, but. You know, would I want to work there? No. Yeah, interesting. It's very interesting because I um, I was hired by Uber in in 2012. I, I kind of got an offer, but I thought this is never going to work out, so I just I didn't I didn't take the role. <laughs> but it's interesting that that yeah, you're opening yourself to also exactly, abuse. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is like, this is therapy now. Um, but it's it's interesting because I did not have that impression of them back then. Maybe that's too early. Maybe this kind of reputation that they had came out later but uh, you may not have you may that. not have seen it, it in was, the recruitment they were 300 process people either. back then yeah, right. so you could imagine how much i'd be worth now so it's uh, that was uh, it was an interesting experience <laughs> um great so let's go back to so you mentioned netflix as being your, your top one yeah just briefly like in a nutshell can you say like why that is why w what is so good about their deck that that sets them apart from others it's it is so specific about what they're looking for, what they want, what the expected behaviors are, mm -hmm. how you progress, um, how the how the organization works. So the interesting thing about about copying or borrowing is eShares and Netflix both talk about in their culture decks. They both talk about being pro sports team based businesses. So they don't run their businesses like a business. They, they run their business like a pro sports team, mm -hmm. okay? The difference between the two is Netflix pay above market rates and eShares, which is now called Carter, pay below market rates. And they both justify it and it, bo and it both makes sense. You know, they, so Netflix want to pay for the best and, for example, they will advise, in, in the deck, they advise their leaders They actually they they advise their employees to go for interviews to understand what their what their salary should be. If their salary should be higher, come and tell us so we can so you don't leave us because you're going for an extra 20k. Mm -hmm. Completely different mindset to a company like Ishes slash Carter, who believe they the company should deserve you. The company should deserve you, yeah. not you deserve exactly. So 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 they, they 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 they. They should create an environment where you want to come. It's not about salary. They, 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 they should, they should, they feel that they, um, th that they've created an environment where you're, you, you want to work here almost irrespective of the salary. So they deserve your presence. Okay. Wow. That takes a little bit of digesting for me. <laughs> Interesting how you can justify that. I had the feeling that when I was at Google, they also, although Google famously pays well, but it f attracts um, very often into, uh, you have to take a seniority cut at mm, Google, mm. right? So when you come from somewhere, another company, as a director, you're not going to be director at Google. You're going to be head at best, mm. right? And they justify that by implicitly, it was not explicitly stated, but it was more like, well, we are Google. So we can do that. Hmm. Whereas that is an interesting take that it's almost. Is it the, is it the same? It's the, it, no, it's the company. No, it's the in, opposite. In, it's the company's in, Car in Carter's, in Ishes' case, it's the company's responsibility 
to, to create an environment where you want to work. Ah, now I got it. Okay, so it's their responsibility to create an environment that you will come to work there, although the salary is below market level. Correct. Ah, interesting. Well, that's a good take. Okay. But I don't think that... Has Isha has made it into your book? Yeah. Is that... Maybe I... Okay. Good. I'll cut, I'll cut that out. <laughs> 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 um, okay. Good. Um... Yeah, that was one in, in important question. Do people actually, once they join, do they actually read the deck? Is it how can entrepreneurs and founders get the message across? Because that's what one of my friends told me. The one with the with the culture deck is that he has people, he has problems getting people to read the damn thing and to kind of live it and to incorporate it. He doesn't want to force it on them that he was not going to plaster the walls with it. But also, he has a problem that he sees how people behave against the principles and he doesn't always want to hey guys read the deck so well if people are behaving against the principles then the principles are wrong or the people are wrong yeah sure but you cannot start firing immediately when you see something bad happening right so it's like it depends on on how badly they're behaving against well, the principles well obviously no it's not like they're not coming naked to work but <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, kind of in ways where you think well no this is just you, you you still have work to do. It's 5 p.m. You're leaving. This is not how we do things around here, right? But it's not fire worthy. Well, I d I'm not sure that's the case. But okay. so so I I believe that if somebody doesn't fit the values of the business, they should not be in the business. And uh, and and fire fast. There's and and quickly, very quickly. Yes. Um, it's not the it's not the role of a culture deck to to make to be the sole driver of, of your culture a culture deck is literally the the first the, 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 so netflix's culture deck has been read 17.8 million times and i can, i would almost guarantee that every single employee ever that's been through netflix has read that i think hubspot has been re read three million hootsuite maybe six hundred thousand. and the so the reason why some why people will read the deck is because they are about to join the company so that they understand what they're joining and if they need to be reminded of something if you need to be reminded of something it means that you're not be, it's not clear it means that there's something missing and so a culture deck is only a support mechanism it isn't the culture it's it says this is how it should say the, the in these situations this is kind of how you behave this is what we expect of you these are our values this is our mission this is how we how we look at gender and diversity or this is how we deal with feedback or this is how we deal with failure but the culture itself should be driven by the actions and 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 initiatives that are taking taken in the company to yeah. define embed and reinforce sure. um, so it's my so my my goal is to in the next 10 years is to create an environment business environment where culture is seen as important as finance or sales and it's it's not the domain of hr or it's not this thing that happens it is there is it is critical to the running of the business so you think there should be something like a chief culture officer yeah it's, it sounds a bit wanky but yeah. i actually do yeah. i i really do because you're just like a cfo touches everything in the organization that where finance has something to do with the chief culture officer should be touching all the points that culture has to do with and, 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 and reinforcing it over time. It's going to be the least popular person in the company. Though. <laughs> this is against the culture. <laughs> well, it depends on how it's done. Yeah. Um, so th not a, not a police. Actually, if culture is done properly, the team should police themselves. Yeah. Versus yeah, somebody yeah. else policing. Of course. It's, there should be somebody that's, that's a looking. Good point. That's a very good point. So it would not be somebody walking around policing people's behavior. No, course, it's that's, it's, that's it's very actually extreme. But it's more like creating mechanisms that get people to check themselves. Almost like when we at Google had this. We and I was in countless meetings where it was really we asked the question. Well, isn't that a bit evil? Right. So it, it's exactly. Not that we did actually evil things, but more like somebody made a joke about something and. Somebody else said, "Well, that would be quite evil, wouldn't it?" But right. using using that that terminology represents so so. There are. I I wrote a blog a while back about 
um, cult-like companies. And one of the one of the thirteen or so points that cult-like companies do is they develop their own language, uh, so their own words or their own you know phrases for that that outsiders don't understand but insiders get and insider. Mm -hmm. So that that's a really good example of one of the strengths of the Google culture. But that one was quite widely understood outside of Google. I think one thing that is that exactly applies to what you say is the word googly, googliness. Don't know if you heard about that. It's like it's one. It's a hiring criteria yeah, on yeah. Google. Yeah, I remember. Where that. they they even like give you. I don't remember. It was like four criteria. One is subject matter knowledge. One is leadership. Third one I don't remember. And one is googliness. Mm. And I specifically get assigned interviews to check this person's googliness. Mm. I did many of them. So. And, and, it's, and it's quite well defined. So that's one of the examples of yeah. how... And I'm sure Google has a certain degree of cult to it. Well, it's so the difference between a cult-like company and your normal company is you'll find that most of the well-run cultures like Apple or Amazon or Tesla have some form of cult-like behavior mm. to them. Uh, Does it come automatically with success? You think? No, it's uh, you've got to work on it. You've, it's, is, is, is it a good thing for you? Yeah, yeah. Cult like companies. Cult like companies are the, uh, there are if you there are very few companies oh. that if you you know I, I can't even pick one. If you if you go to uh, uh, randomly BMW, BMW have a motorcycle department that is cult like. Okay, it's a separate separate unit. But they they they've cre they've created a very specific um, persona around motorbikes that people aspire to because they've created a cult-like environment, and I believe the best companies are run in a cult-like manner. And I'm not talking about cults. So the the thing about companies is most of them, all of them, if not all of them, cannot become cults, and there's there are two reasons for that. The first one is most companies sell an actual product. They don't sell um, redemption, exactly, <laughs> or happiness in the next life. Yeah. Um, so you can actually touch and feel this thing that people sell, um, that, that 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 companies sell. And the second thing is, the cults encourage the limitation or extraction of independent thought. And if you did that in a company, you would destroy your company. When have you seen in the research that you've done, have you seen any pitfalls, the f culture decks where um, when somebody is trying to do their own culture deck that you should try to avoid? I'm thinking, for example, especially about too much kind of like inspirational languages. You see that quite a lot in, in, in culture decks, I think, where you just s say that, you want the superstar, you know, the best of the best to, to join you and so on. This kind of like fluff language, for example. That was one thing that yeah. struck me. Is there any other pitfalls that you saw? Or is this even a pitfall? I, well, I've, see, I've, I've, seen that, I've seen that as well. The, um, the, the sort of salesy language or the, you know, which, which the problem with that is if you compare it to a really well-written culture deck, you look a little bit silly because, you know, if you go and look at HubSpot or Hootsuite or patreon um you 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 get they, they they're going to deep levels within the organization or deep levels that are required within the organization so um I, yeah i would recommend against that what i see company people try and do is try to write it all in one go um and mm -hmm. and and that actually ends up where they they get discouraged because they get lost in in that process of trying to get it all down mm -hmm. versus you know, let's start here and grow it up and build it over time. Yeah, um, the, the the gradual yeah evolution of it is important. Th you mentioned one company who um, was, I think you termed it as lucky, that they grew their culture so organically that they then essentially just needed to write down what um, what was already manifest mm. on a day to day basis. Is this something that? happens like it's a once in a blue moon thing uh, or have you seen in your research many companies who where you just simply go in there and this even without having thought much about it about culture they somehow manage to hire the right people 
and the culture is right, that they just would need to essentially write it all down. I, I actually think a lot of companies do do this quite well in, in terms of growing and developing without deliberate thought towards their, towards their culture or deliberate action towards their culture. And mm -hmm. the, the founding team managed to keep it together as the, as the business scales. And they essentially, it's all about recruiting. So it's all about recruiting people that fit with the values. And so the values then can be transferred further down as the company grows. One of the big challenges I'm seeing in London right now is because the founders are the founders are not making any efforts in the early stages to define their culture they grow quite there's quite a quick growth in certain companies mm -hmm. and you'll see at the b round all of a sudden a lot of their initial team leave mm -hmm. and the reason for this can be can be traced all the way back to not defining their culture ah. Because what they do, what happens is at the B round, now you've got, I don't know, 20, 25 million perhaps. And now you start hiring and, and founders get all goo-goo-eyed over the logos on, on the CVs. So you'll hire from ah. Facebook or you will hire from yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'll, because, you're not, because you're impressed with that logo and blown away by the way that person sells to you, you you're not, and you don't really know, you're not recruiting against the values of your culture. You, you hire these rock stars and your team are going, but they don't fit. They don't, they're not like us. They don't behave like us. And they're trying to bring in new structures and new processes. And I do believe it's necessary. There will be some churn. Some churn is necessary because, um, you know, when, when you're going through those changes in a, in a, in a high-growth company, at different stages, you are going to lose some people who don't like the new way of working. But if you're able to recruit against your values all, all the way through the process, you will have low relatively low churn if mm -hmm. no churn mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. best companies do that mm -hmm. and this is i'm seeing this a lot now so that b round you just see an exodus of the original team and they because they've now got experience and knowledge and you know they either go and set up their own thing because it's not good enough to you know it's not good enough to be in the new environment okay interesting um you or most of the companies that you portray are tech companies is it of course you you've you've, you've uh, worked in this space for a long time so this is naturally your your world but are there no <coughs> are there no old school companies you know i don't know you would say the likes of walmart or ge or anything like that who also have good culture decks where you would say that that's a good example of an old school company that is, has a good set of values or culture decks? So there, there, are, there are the ones that I would like to see because I know they have interesting cultures are 3M and I think 3M is probably the original culture focused company. I think culture they have their own post-it notes. <laughs> um, the other one is um, WL Gore and Associates. They, I think, Google and a lot of other companies borrowed their model of of setting up factories, mm -hmm. not for factories, but for um, software engineers. Um, but I, I, I'm not aware of their of their culture decks. Um, and I think, I think because you know Netflix were the first one to put it out there. A bunch of the tech companies have just followed suit because it makes sense mm -hmm. um there's a there's a comp there's a, a charity uh, this charity called possible.org which has mm -hmm. got an amazing mm -hmm. yeah, you that, a really yeah. amazing they have uh, a very good one yeah, really amazing like culture deck uh, it's very it, it, it balance it hits a nice balance between um purpose and business and and making and and not business but purpose and um uh, sustainable uh, impact mm -hmm. um which i which i really like so, in the UK, which is obviously the market you know best, which companies would you um, hold uh, up as the best examples of companies who have a great company culture? Um, so, the first one that jumps to mind is Makers Academy. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, you, you, you actually can define, you do define your own salary. How is that possible? <laughs> How do they just... You, you they simply don't hire people who would just say, I want half a million. Well, no, they, they certainly wouldn't do that. Um, but uh, they hire people where the salary is within a range. And um, when, you, when you join, you will 
you will be inf- you you are you're informed as to um, what the range is, and you then and they'll also tell you what the market average is. They'll give you a lot of data, and they will you will then talk to other people in the company about what their salaries are. And then every year, you set your salary. So you write a um, an essay about what you've done. Ah, so you justify. You, it, well, you know, you don't. This is the interesting thing. You know, f- at first, it feels like justifying, but what you do is you write an essay about what you um, what you've done that year, and then you go and speak to your colleagues, and you say, "Here's my essay. Please read it." And your colleagues will say, "But you did that, and you also did this, and you did that, and remember that. And what about this?" And you then go to you you then during that conversation you get a sense of should i actually be giving myself more or should i giving be giving myself less and at the same time during the year other people are are having these conversations with you about their salaries and so at at the end of the day you at the end of the process you go and say okay this is my salary now Mm. And because you've had this conversation and because you know what everybody else is earning and because you know what the market average is and because it's, it's really clever. That's very it, clever. It removes all the friction from I want 10% more or I deserve X or what are, what are they on? Or It's, it's brilliant. It's and a, it's much more a, it's a collaborative way of getting things mm-hmm. done where the, whereas the normal salary negotiation is an antagonistic way. Yeah. Like how much can I grab from yeah. the company? Yeah. And this one is more like, well, how much what's right deserve, what's fair what's right what's yeah. fair exactly so so make it as academy jump out um i i really like what um the guys at charlie hr are doing mm-hmm. um they've uh, they've 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 really gone into feedback and radical candor in a in a big way um and they like the other companies that are really doing great stuff or and on nurturing their culture on a you know weekly basis daily basis they have if you're if you're a new joiner within your first month you have to do a presentation about yourself and how you relate to the the values of the of the company mm-hmm. um, they have uh, monthly one to one chats where you sit you walk around with your, your your manager and the manager will just ask you how you're living the values and what can I do to improve you living the values and how are you doing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tell me, you know, give me feedback about myself. Okay. So these companies are really embedding it and reinforcing it on an, on, a, on an annual basis or daily basis. And the other one I really like is Skimlinks. Um, and uh, I mean, they do a lot of a lot of good stuff. But they actually, Alita set up a culture committee, um, and that culture committee are sort of the eyes and ears of of, of a growing business. And really, you know, they meet regularly to just think about how do we improve this? What do we do about it? What's the feedback from the yeah. from from the team? Um, what should we be focusing on from a culture perspective? How do we live the values better? And I, I just like that. It just demonstrates the the importance of the culture in the organization. How much is Glassdoor a good gauge of company culture? When somebody researches a company and whether they want to go there to work, I've heard it's like many people actually go and check it out and see the va- the stars, yeah, yeah. The, the the value. What's your experience there? So as a, as a headhunter, um, I've worked with more um, positive glass door ratings than 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 negative glass door ratings in terms of the my clients. Mm-hmm. But so they were on the higher end. Correct, but yeah. where, where I have had clients who are on the lower end of the scale for whatever reason. Um, I've had candidates have come to me and said, I've checked the glass door rating. Why should I join this company? What's, you know, what's different? Why? Because you can actually see what, you know, what people are saying yeah. and the negative stuff. And often there's been a turnaround or some sort of situation where this is the reason why it is like that. And this is the reason mm-hmm. why it's changing. And, you know, it, nothing's perfect in any organization. This company is less so, but you're the right person to help change that. Um, so, but Glassdoor is, th- there aren't many um, ways for, com- for individuals to really evaluate a company's culture. Um, and Glassdoor is definitely so a, it is one, a, just yeah. one source, but probably when you're a job seeker, you should, it should not be the only thing you rely on when assessing the company culture. Yeah, correct. Is, the, is there any other? So, we're not, we were normally, to- until now, mainly speaking from the 
founders, from the people owning and running the business point of view. But let's quickly put on the hat of the employee. What are, is there like a good way of seeing through a, how the company presents themselves and really understanding what's it going to be like? I'm asking also because of to briefly my experience. I joined a company once which sold itself really well and the, the values that they portrayed were seemed great, but then they didn't live them and, and mm. we, we, we um, broke up <laughs> pretty quickly. So what can one do? Is there any, have you, ex any this is, this is a really, comes with experience? it's, yeah, it's yeah. a really, it's a really challenging oh. um, one because I, I, I have 50 questions that I would ask um, to really understand, you know, the, the hundred questions that I would ask to understand the culture of the business, but that's yeah. because this is something that I think about and eat and live and breathe exactly. all day, every day versus, you know, uh, people who um, don't, um, think about it as much as I do so it's quite difficult it's not easy but the you know the, I think there are ways to ask the right questions and ask consistency of questions so mm -hmm. you know my advice to somebody who hasn't done a lot of thinking about this or, or, or reading about it is to just come up with three questions that you think define the culture that you that what you're picking up or what's important to you mm -hmm. And then ask each person you interview the same question each time yes. and see what the consistency ah, is. That's good. Yeah. That's that's the best way of doing it if you you know if if you're up for a for a for a for a bunch of interviews in a in a company. That's going to test both, of course, because the questions you choose are going to be aligned to your personal values. So I if if it is important to you, it is important to the company. And also it tests for the strength of the culture, i.e. if this is across the inter the people who you talk to, whether they agree, so whether there's consistency. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. What, briefly as we're heading towards the end um, of our conversation, what is your opinion about all these, I find them very interesting, these attempts to remove or curtail hierarchies. Like there's holacracy. Mm like self-managing teams. There's a, a keyword, a buzzword thrown around, which I, I like as teal organizations. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on them? Is this something that is kind of like the next stage of how we, be, how we will be working together? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, I've, not, I've not come across, I haven't had the chance to interview enough companies on the hol holacracy f um, environmental field to really really understand more than i've read in the press which generally has not been so positive mm. um about it um yeah, zappos hasn't received much good press for it. no and yeah. uh, but you know they you know he he is clearly just determined to do it and uh, i take my hat off to to him um i think i do i do believe this is the future um i because mainly there is there is a new there are a couple of drivers of this the first one is um the old hierarchical model was essentially defined from the army where you when you passed or the military where you passed information down on a need-to-know basis and the person at the top had access to all of the information that was coming up and then could s could choose where to send them information down to so um, at, you, you, you could build a pyramid, mm -hmm. you know, now the information is actually freely available on the internet for the most part. There's a lot of information about, uh, not necessarily about the company, but there is a lot more information, uh, uh, available to people to, to source through digital means. So the exclusivity of knowledge and the exclusivity to, to owning that knowledge is a, is a lot less. Um, mm -hmm. uh, applicable, mm -hmm. so you're seeing companies naturally flatten because because of that. You know you don't need the hierarchy in in companies that you did. Um, the W. L. Gore, they was founded in the fifties, and everybody employed in the company is an associate. There is no hierarchy. The CEO is voted in by the by the organization. How big is the company? Uh, three billion dollars and oh, okay, so and I don't know how many thousand wow. people. Um, they vote the CEO. Vote the CEO in, 
um, they they all they 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 manu manufacture Gore-Tex and other ah. products. Mm. Um, they specifically um, made a rule that as soon as it gets close to the 150 to 200, the Dunbar I number, heard about that, yeah. they open another uh, they open, open another office, factory, yeah. mm. and if you're employed by the company, you are not employed to fulfill a specific role, you can choose which team you want to join. So it's the responsibility of the team lead for that moment mm. in time to encourage you to come and work for them because they need your skills mm, mm. and they need to be able to pitch to you as a new employee. Mm. So it turns the entire business on its head. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible, and that, that's been going like that, for, uh, been operating like that since the 50s. But why is it so rare still? I mean, the vast majority of companies don't operate that way. Even the vast majority of startups don't operate that way. Because it requires a certain amount of trust and freedom to knowledge and um, belief, self, uh, belief in self-management mm. that in the typical structure is missing. Um, so uh, Ricardo Semler of Semco, mm -hmm. he did this. He, took his, he flattened his organization. And I can't remember exactly what the numbers were, but I think there was something like, I can't remember exactly, but 10 or 11 levels of management between himself and the lowest level of, of, of um, shop floor yeah. uh, worker. And by the time he was finished, there were four. Oh. And then they fired him because he'd done his job and they didn't need him anymore mm -hmm. from his own company. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's happening more and more. And you can actually see there is this, as you said, the teal, the self-management, self-leadership piece that's, that, that, that's in increasingly um, becoming more prevalent because people accept that, I guess, on a fundamental level, we run our, day, our daily lives. We don't need anybody to manage us. Not all of us pay our bills on time and not all of us do it perfectly. But, you know, we, we, you know, we, 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 we live fine. Now, why all of a sudden do we have to be managed and controlled and restricted in a company the, because we are you know, we're actually capable human beings. Mm. We may need to learn a little, a little bit from time to time, but we know, we know we can do stuff. And I think that's what's happening in, yeah, in, yeah. in the market. Well, obviously, I mean, the, the one extreme is the stuff that made Scott Adams draw Dilbert, yeah. right? that kind of behavior where you completely infantilize and made into a moron. And then there's the ultra holacracy uh, Zappos on the uh, other side of the spectrum which assumes that everybody is as like super autonomous and very mature human being and so on. And I think there, obviously the truth will lie somewhere in, in the middle, probably more towards the independently minded type of uh, spectrum. Uh, sorry, towards the end of that spectrum. Yeah, I think the other thing that's driving this particular um, movement is the millennial generation. Yeah. Because they don't, they don't accept the old ways of working they don't accept the old structures and if you're if you if they the, they expect to develop they expect to grow they expect to be given responsibility mm. almost even where they don't deserve it but they still expect it mm. um and i'm seeing this in in a lot of companies where very very young relatively inexperienced uh, individuals are running huge departments mm. just because they scale up and they learn mm. um so i there are a number of factors driving this and i think in 10 years time middle you know organizations will be a lot flatter yeah you mentioned yourself that it's very difficult to get founders to discuss the topic of culture and to spend time on it because they have a billion other things to yeah. worry about have you found in your conversations something that maybe you can tie that into a kind of final mention of your book and so on um how do you get founders to pay attention to the topic of culture how do you ca how can you make convince them of the necessity of its own department almost right of the chief culture officer that we discussed i think going to the chief culture officer for most founders is a step too far um, most founders are way more receptive to a discussion on culture and values and the importance of values in across the organization specifically recruitment where they've actually felt pain so once once the wheels start to shake a bit because the nuts aren't screwed on properly, that's when you that's when founders are way more receptive to it as they start to scale and they realize that it's not it's you know they, they don't have as much control they can't 
spread themselves that thin. They're focusing on strategy and and you know opening the U.S. for example, or going you know going international. Now all of a sudden they've got other people in place who they're not sure if these people are good ma good good matches for who they're going to hire. So yeah. as soon as they start to feel some pain is when they're way more receptive to it. And I and there's you know the, the, as human beings you need to learn, you know. So I, I'm I'm my whole goal is to educate and the purpose of the book is to demonstrate that uh, what other companies are doing in this space the the what the best companies or some of the best companies in on the planet are doing about this and how they have managed to build multi-billion dollar businesses where a lot of them say the driver of these businesses is the culture mm. you know it's, you, you mentioned Ray Dalio earlier and Bridgewater you know, it's it's everything. Everything he, he almost has to talk about now is his culture, yeah, and 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 the principles and how they drive it. And as you say, and I really like that part of the book where you said culture is the one thing that is entirely in your power, or how do you you, you phrase it better? Yeah, the um, culture is the one competitive advantage. Competitive advantage yes. that a CEO, for the most part, has total control over. Yes, exactly. And uh, the person said to me, "But what happens if somebody?" you know, headhunts your COO. And I said, well, actually, your COO wasn't meant to be there. You can, you can, you can then recruit a better COO, somebody mm. who fits the values better. Mm. You know, for whatever reason, they were headhunted out. You can, but that doesn't, that will impact your business slightly, but it doesn't change your culture mm -hmm. because your culture is, the, is, is you as the CEO and the sum of its parts, which, is the, which are the team. You now have a young family. Is, this a, is it also a, a good opportunity to think about your own family culture is this something should you should the the idea of thinking consciously about how we get things done here also be applied to the personal yeah, absolutely the, because at the end of the day your values if, especially if you're the founder of a business your values drive the culture and and my wife and I um, took one of my documents um, that I that I have for for having a discussion about personal values and the day before our wedding um two days before our wedding we had dinner and both filled the form out and then compared oh, wow. <laughs> to see how we, <laughs> to see the overlap oh my god uh, and so and great. luckily <laughs> it turns out that the overlap was pretty good can you share what kind of questions they were or is that too personal no no it's not they're not questions it's literally a list of 60 values about you yeah And so you just choose 10 and then you line the 10 up one against the other. Okay. And you go and say, okay, well, where are we, where are we really well matched up and where are we not? And, and, you know, so for, you, for example, you've got continuous learning and continuous development. So there is, there, you know, I, I think I was continuous development and, and Monica was continuous learning. They're not exactly the same, but they demonstrate there's an overlap in yeah. terms of self-improvement. Mm -hmm. Um, versus I can't remember exactly I think Monica was a little bit less um, focused on uh, her personal success whereas I was more you know success oriented yeah. at the time so you we could just we could just line these two up and go oh, there's there's mm. a, it's, I think we were we overlap really well on six out of ten which mm. is mm. which is pretty good yeah which is I think the basis of a good relationship ultimately is do you have aligned values yeah right and so that's very good example of you doing that and i love that the fact that you live your mission that is very apparent and the, the the passion clearly comes through from the book you also live it in your personal life so it's interesting brett thank you so very much where can people find more about the book and how can they get in touch if they want to so so the book you can uh, do a search for culture decks decoded on amazon or you can have a look at the, my website www.culturegene.ai culturegene.ai yeah excellent Brett, thank you so very much for Michael, taking the time. Michael, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening, guys and gals. If you like this and want to know when new episodes come out, subscribe to the Unsafe Spaces podcast on unsafespacespodcast.com. And I see you around when the time comes to again dig beneath the surface and challenge conventional wisdoms.